Well, Dr. Jones, time for one last ride. Late to this one because uh, I did not rush out to the theater to see this. I didn't get out to the theater to see much this year. But I have now seen Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Uh, this is one of a number of kind of notorious flops of 2023. Uh, flop is, it's weird in this context. If they hadn't spent as much money to make this as they did, it would have been more or less break even, but like they lost money on this because they spent too much money on it. But in terms of high profile flops, there was stuff like this, The Flash, uh, Wish isn't shaping up too great uh, for Disney right now, The Marvels. But uh, this is on the list of things that badly underperformed in 2023 compared to what was expected of them. And you know what? It's not that bad. It's actually pretty fun. Ultimately, I enjoyed this. And I say that as someone who, like, was seeing all the flaws. Like, I, I've seen enough of this stuff that I could tell like, say, during the de-aged uh, Harrison Ford precursor segment. Like, they kind of, it's not really a cold open. It goes on too long. But the, the opening section of the thing, which is actually set still during World War II, and they de-age him, um, I could tell which were the hero shots, the one they'd really made sure, like, this has to look perfect, and what ones were, like, eh, good enough. I caught it. I could tell. Now, like, they picked the right ones to be the hero shots, but, like, I was still noticing it. Um, you know, a lot of CG, a lot of, lot of compositing. Some of it's good, some of it's not. The thing was, though, I had a special benefit for me for watching this. I actually watched this with my mother. And my mother is a big Indiana Jones fan. She's the one who introduced me to Indiana Jones. And I was able, through her enjoyment of the movie to set aside at least some of my normal nitpicks. Because, like, I could easily go into how, you know, all this stuff that they clearly spent too much money on, a lot of it could have been dropped. It doesn't need to be two and a half hours. And there's also, like, for all the action that's in it, it's an awful lot of chases, funny thing. Uh, when you have a chase with, you know, a, a car or, or something, uh, Harrison Ford gets to sit down. And, like, I'm noticing all these things, but... I I was under circumstances and with the right company that despite my normal inclinations, I was able to kind of let that go for the course of this. And the thing is that would not automatically grant the movie a pass because if I let go of my hangups on, it's too long, uh, the action is almost all chases and there's too much CGI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even if I set aside my normal critique brain that's picking out those things, which I was able to do, and I normally can't when watching on my own, but um, I was able to do that in this case. But that does not guarantee that I think well of it, because that means that whatever's left over when I'm not nitpicking those things, i.e. performances, characters, story, that still has to work. And it does, for the most part. Actually, <laughs> this, uh, this is a statement that will get a whole bunch of people to immediately click off the video and stop watching. I would personally call this the third best Indiana Jones movie. And for the record, it's Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, Last Crusade, Dial of Destiny, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Temple of Doom. And I know, I know that that putting Temple of Doom at the bottom is going to take a lot of people off. But look... The simple, the metric is simply this. If you were to ask me, you can't watch the uh, the two best Indiana Jones movies. Out of the three that's left, what ones will you watch again? I would more readily watch this one than I would Crystal Skull. And Crystal Skull, I don't hate, but it's not great. And I would more readily watch Crystal Skull than I would Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom is just a mean movie. It's just unpleasant. There's some stuff there, but it's not a lot. Anyways, this is not a review of Temple of Doom. This is a review of Dial of Destiny. This has a good sense of things. It, it, it manages to avoid some of the uh, issues that might seem superficial, but kind of took me out of um, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. 
I want to say like the lack of Nazis were a problem. And that can seem off like what was wrong with the communists? Didn't they work? They kind of did. But honestly, Indy is at home punching Nazis, which, you know, he should still be doing. Everyone should still be doing. Punch Nazis in the face. Be Indiana Jones. Um, but it just feels better. And I think it was a very smart move to connect this to the moon landing and Operation Paperclip and the um, Nazi scientists that were brought in to actually build our space program because that's a thing that really happened. And I think that's a really good way to reconnect him to the antagonist he is best suited to be put up against. And he just feels most at home taking on and taking down. So I think that helps. Good uh, villain, Mads Mikkels. Mads Mikkels is really good for this kind of role. He brings just enough sense of, well, he brings a sense of gravitas, of personality, but not like plastered on personality. What you what you see of a character he plays always feels very genuine. And he's just real good. He's real good for a part like this. Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, uh, the character of Helena. So Indy's goddaughter. I'm not I'm not super familiar with this actress. Like I know Fleabag is the thing she's most known for. I haven't seen any of that. I thought she worked for the kind of character she was playing, who is, you know, a bit of a con artist, bit of a flies by the seat of her pants type, and she's got a good presence for that kind of character. Uh, interestingly, the film even did some things that would normally annoy me, but it managed to do something with them to actually bring some purpose for doing that, um, such as we start the movie and Marion and Indy are split up again, because of course, and that annoyed me. But as the thing progressed and we got a little more information on that, I'm like, oh, okay, that actually feels like it has an impact on the characters in the situation and where Indiana Jones is. And another thing that this thing benefits from the idea of, you know, going to the moon, Indy's going to feel like more of a relic than he ever has because, well, his whole thing is looking to the past and everyone's looking to the future now. So I think that was a that was a good pairing um, just thematically of things. This feels better thought out than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Um, this this feels like it it has themes <laughs> that it actually wants to do something with. And I think it does them relatively successfully. And then we also get um, some fun cameos, some from returning characters, some uh, just from actors who I'd like to see. Hi, Antonio Banderas. You're not in this movie a lot, but it's nice to see you. Literally in anything. And I don't want to go into spoilers because... You know, enough people didn't rush to the theater to see this that people might be checking this out to see, should I bother watching this movie? Um, but I will say that the, for me, I can get why, like, maybe some people would be, like, the core conceit of what it is the Dial of Destiny does that has, that some people might be like, really? For me, I, not only was I on board with it, I thought they handled it really well and did some really interesting things with it, right down to, um, you know, some of the unexpected uh, bumps in the road along the way towards the tail end. And it's also worth noting that I also don't have a problem with the aliens in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull either. So I guess take that into consideration on how much you want to value my opinion. But um, overall, this just felt like a much better note to end the franchise on. And... I enjoyed it. Again, it helped a lot that I watched it with somebody who doesn't care about the about the things that my nitpicky critic brain cares about. Does that mean I'm saying you have to shut your brain off to enjoy it? I don't think so. I think that's an overstatement. But if you have an overly fine-tuned uh, critical apparatus, which I do because this is my job, you might want to try and dial that back because if you if you can, and if you can't, that doesn't make you a bad viewer. But if you can, I think there's a really solid uh, denouement to Indiana Jones's stories here. I think the performances are solid. I think the story works pretty well. It's like it's a little bloated. There's a there's a few uh, you know story threads that could have been trimmed and saved us about twenty minutes. Um, that probably would have been to the better man of the movie, but it doesn't fully drag. It's moving well enough along that 
I didn't feel bored and I didn't feel like it was just slogging through it. I'm I'm way more likely to go back and give this one a second watch than uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and um, significantly more than Temple of Doom. So ultimately, it, if the idea of an Indiana Jones this old doesn't inherently just make you go, oh God, please don't do that, then I actually say give it a shot. If you are not super keen on an indie uh, this old or like an entry in the film sort of this late from its heyday, then I don't think this is good enough to turn you around if that's where you're coming from. But if you're at least open to the notion that it could be good and it could be fun, I think you can find fun here. And I think you can find good here. It's just not going to turn you around if you think the whole thing was a bad idea. <laughs> so there we go. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. It's not going to make my 10 best of the year, but it was a better time than I was expecting. You see, know what you think about it. Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the top, in the, in the topics, in the comments. Let's talk about it. I, I will allow for the topic, that's, my brain was getting ahead of me, the topic of spoilers to be discussed in the comments. Put a spoiler tag warning at the top of your comment, though, if you're going to do that, and if you want my opinions on any of that stuff. But, um... Patreon is what enables me to pay the bills if you want to help me continue to do this as my living. Even if you can't help me out that way, like, share, subscribe. They all help me out as well. Links to all the stuff I do down in the, down in the description. Don't worry too much about it, though, because we take a relaxed attitude around here so you can just come on back next time you need a break. Time for me to thank my highest supporting patrons. Robin Moore, Zubin Lafula, Goddess Elida, Oliver B, Tarak, The Thing That Goes Doink in the Anime, Ruth, Goes with the Gazarian, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Geek Filter, Melinda Walters, Toku BL Hubian, Jen, Auntie Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Renabi Likes the Poodle, Robin Powell, T Love, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Dave Hall, Quite Bearish, Rosalind Bennett, Pau Barabajagal, I'm sorry for whatever butchery I did to that, and Mira G. I know I've kind of done like funky stuff saying them the last few times. I had this whole idea where I was going to like sing them to the tune of Carol of the Bells, but then I realized it's going to like clash with my outro music and I didn't really want to rework that or just cut the outro music out altogether. That felt weird. So I just, I just didn't, I just didn't, I just didn't do a thing this time. But now I've told you that I didn't do a thing. So I've made a thing about there being no thing. Okay. Thanks for sticking around. Bye.